What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here from Data Dash and today is October 6th of 2023. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video we've got to spend some time to not only talk about what's going on with Bitcoin's price as we continue to face near-term resistance at around the same range we were back in August and also back in May of 2023. But outside of that as well, I want to dive into what's going on with Ethereum, the broader altcoin market, and dive back into the macro perspective as some big things have been changing here over the last couple of days. So I want to spend some time talking about what it likely means and where we're going here over the next few weeks and months. We've got a lot to unpack here in today's video, so if you guys happen to enjoy it, consider dropping a like. It's one of the greatest ways you can support the channel. Thank you guys for being patient with me as well as I'm traveling at the moment. Not in the usual studio today. But anyways, let's go ahead and kick things off here. The first thing I want to analyze is around price action. Although the price action of the last few days hasn't been ultra bearish by any means, and it's not a significant trend deviation from the kind of short-term move up here since back around 25 k in early September, we are still facing some chop here on multiple days against this range where we topped out in August of 2023 after the SEC supposed uh, law, excuse me, the victory of uh, Grayscale, the largest ETN uh, product creator for Bitcoin, supposedly won their case against the SEC, which to be honest, at the end of the day, it wasn't really a victory. And that's why markets unloaded those gains just over the next few days. But outside of that as well, you can see that this was also technical resistance here around May of 2023, and it held down price for a long period of time between both March and April 2023. So this level at 28K is a pretty significant one that we need to keep in our radar here. Um, those even levels in general at $1,000 intervals, the $5,000 intervals, $10,000 intervals, those are always going to have psychological importance, and the larger you get on those intervals, the more significant it's usually going to be. Right? Same reason why 30K has been pretty significant resistance here. It's a big even level, and especially for those who, again, might have bought down here if they were lucky enough or bought down in this range here between June and October, when people are watching those early levels, potentially uh, those even levels to potentially take profits. Uh, next up, I want to spend some time to talk about ETH. Again, we've continued to maintain bearish on altcoins right now. Uh, altcoin dominance has not gotten small enough to where we feel that there's real capitulation to go long on altcoins. And yet again, the charts are proving this. I mean, just over the long term here, month by month, we are generally seeing that altcoins are moving lower. Even Ethereum, more defensive play in the altcoin space, down 4.7% this week against Bitcoin. I understand some people might say, why don't we take a look here at ETHUSD? All right, why don't we take a good look here at how the actual price is doing in USD terms? And well, it's really not looking much better. Uh, we have continued to fail to get back into this ascending triangle here. Like a lot of altcoin pairs that have broken their long-term technical patterns, uh, ETH had two attempts here to try to get back in here, and unfortunately each and every time getting knocked down and continuing to spend more and more time outside of this ascending triangle. That is a really bad sign here, guys. I don't care, at, from a fundamentals perspective, I don't care about ETH2. I don't care so much about EIP1559. These are all great things that do benefit Ethereum. But what the market is telling me here is that now these technologies are deployed and ETH's monetary policy has been, in a sense, reformed or is inflating much less, that it's still not enough. There is still an imbalance between supply and demand here. More specifically, there are more people willing to market sell than market buy. And that's clearing through a lot of bids on the ask, uh, excuse me, bids on the order book and continue to push prices even lower here rather than the opposite of clearing through the asks or the higher sell orders on the order book. Now outside of that as well, we also have the altcoin market itself. And more specifically, taking a look at the total weighted market cap when we subtract Ethereum and stablecoin market cap. We can generally see that the market value has risen from around 200 billion back here in early September towards here at 220 billion with a relative high recently around 227. Again, no serious significant trend here in regards to price. Now I will say one thing that is a positive sign if we take it here towards say the weekly time frame and just kind of zoom out, as much as we are not really seeing a continuation and trend to the upside, a significant breakout. What we are seeing is the potential formation of a wedge here. And this is an opportunity where altcoins need to show up to the plate. The bulls out there need to show that they actually have the narratives ready, the excitement, and the potential liquidity, the buy side liquidity, to drive altcoins higher here. All right, as we've been having essentially these higher lows since December 2022, as well as here in June of 2023, 
and also here in August and September 2023. Now, if this level or this ascending line of support, again, doesn't continue to show up here as a provided range of support, and we snap through there below 200 billion, altcoins are likely heading back down here to the lower part of the range at around 150 billion. We've been calling for that for a long time here on the channel. Time will tell if we get it right, but that's been our bet here that altcoins need a third final low on that line of support to find real capitulation. And from there, we can really essentially wipe out a lot of the secondary gains here uh, from the uh, recovery from the prior bear market all right, back in 2008, 2019. So uh, I think, again, that's a relatively conservative level to ask for. But we're going to watch the chart here. If we do snap out through here around $250 billion, that's still likely going to also be a great buy-the-dip opportunity if we really are in a new bull market, right? So it's not about actually getting the absolute lows, guys. Don't fall into that trap because... There are a lot of times where, hey, I, I think I'm going to buy the low here. I think I'm going to buy the low, where at the end of the day, you could still be very well buying it at a high price premium. Uh, I, I would actually point more up here, where a lot of people probably thought they were buying the dip or buying the bear market dip, right? It's very easy in hindsight to say, oh, I should have bought this and that, right? It's about doing what we, we can realistically here within the market with what we have to work with and playing probabilities. The next thing I want to talk about here is, is kind of stepping into the macro because while crypto is, again, still in either a no-trend scenario or, more specifically, I think, it is still hinting those signs of, of kind of a bearish amount of price action in the long run, that all being realized, no matter where you stand on that, the macro scene here is getting continuously contractionary. Uh, the dollar is continuing to accelerate since back in July. We've cooled down here over the last few days, uh, but generally speaking, minus this past week, uh, we have continued to maintain that uptrend here. If we start to, say, get down here to 105 or below 106, this might be a sign here that we're ready for a short-term cool-down. What I care most about here when I'm checking the dollar is seeing how it reacts here around this range. We've got a little, like, golden range here on our chart. This has been kind of the key price level here, as I mentioned earlier, 106 to 105.5. How price, or more specifically, how the dollar index, uh, you know, kind of reacts around that range in, as it's taking into account the dollar euro pair, Japanese yen, British pound, all the major world reserve currencies out there. Essentially speaking, how it performs at this range is going to be very critical to understand as to whether or not we've got the room to continue accelerating higher. I want to go ahead and turn off the drawings here and just take it here towards the monthly chart. Right, we're going to be looking over multiple decades here. And I want you guys to, again, just kind of take a look here as we look throughout the long term, sorry, the chart's taking it just a couple of seconds to load there. There we go. Now, one thing that I think is a bit scary is uh, we, we essentially don't want to repeat of what happened in the 80s. We, we want to hope that the Fed is going to be doing what they're supposed to be doing now, and that is to keep rates high, if anything, continue to raise them and put us into a mild recession here in the near term in order to balance supply and demand equilibrium, right? To bring about equilibrium between consumer demand and the available supply for goods and services in the economy, and to reduce that excess liquidity that was printed over the past few years. However, if the Fed starts to pivot here, I would say that the dollar is probably one of your best investment bets here over the next couple years if we do see an early stage pivot, because as we see here in the 80s, when there was the inflationary crisis and the Fed had to take interest rates to such abnormal levels, such as 15% or more, you can see that the dollar index moved from roughly around the same current level we're at now against other currencies up more than 50%. Now, if you guys understand, in Forex markets, a general 50% move in the dollar versus other world currencies is massive. And that is by far, you know, with, with the ability to use leverage in moderate amounts, you're going to need to use it in Forex markets and crypto. It's, it's a death sentence in a lot of ways. But if you are using uh, leverage here in Forex markets and you've got a 50% move, right? I mean, you can make life-changing returns from that, much more than I think what you could likely even make here in the next bull market just buying Bitcoin if and when that comes, right? So I'm just saying here at the end of the day, if the Fed pivots, the only bet you've got here, I think, is, is really betting along the dollar because they're, they're just kicking the can down the road. Now, if they do things right here, I think in the, in the, uh, the more likely scenario, as the Fed is, is likely learning from history to some degree, is that the dollar is going to continue to gain some strength here. You know, they're going to do things right. It's going to hang in this range here between the prior relative highs of September 2022, and I think at max come up to where it was here in 2000. But generally speaking, I think the key point here is that 
uh, you know, until we see some significant trend change in the dollar, which we have not seen yet, the dollar is reinforcing back strength here. Essentially, I can't be short the dollar. And so long as I'm not short the dollar, I'm continuing to believe that we're entering into a risk-off environment or a more specifically a recessionary environment. Take a look here at the yield curve we talked about the other day. I wanted to just look at it here in the monthly chart. See that clear acceleration here, guys. All right, we had some, some big spikes here like in March that faded very quickly after. When you have multi-month consistent uptrends like this since July, this is your, I mean, your acceleration here to showcase that, hey, as we said, it's time to batten down the hatches. In the next 6, 12 months, we're likely going to see a recession. I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. I don't know exactly to point you towards what specific sector is going to be the first domino. There will probably be many dominoes that fall, and unfortunately some certain sectors that get hit really hard. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, to think that this will not impact Bitcoin, this is going to be a direct indicator of a recession. And during a recession, you're going to have a lot of people who don't have the same kind of income or disposable income, more specifically, to invest in various asset classes. And that is going to hit the sentiment, not just for retail investors, but institutions as well, as everyone is paying down debts, they're expecting lower economic activity, lower incomes, lower discretionary, or, or kind of in this case, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we talked about earlier, that ability to have some additional income to invest in various assets, right? Disposable income. If we aren't going to have that, then that's going to impact risk on assets like crypto, many of which, again, are being invested in by retail investors mainly, not institutions. I want to make that very clear. If you're talking about the altcoin market, uh, that's mainly retail driven for the most part. If you're talking about Bitcoin as well, uh, I'll say this, as much as institutions may be interested in Bitcoin, if they don't have the retail backing, which is providing the market order flow buy side pressure that actually leads Bitcoin to have those parabolic run-ups, then they're likely not going to be so risk on towards investing in crypto and rather would look towards equities. Take a look here at the VIX. The VIX here is still hanging around the same range it was in May or all the way back here towards March. So we have really cut back a lot of gains and mitigating volatility. And this is again a worrying sign that if we snap through this range here, guys, around 21, I would say on the VIX, you got pain coming big time in the next few weeks and months. That's going to likely mean that we're entering now into a recession, but a full-scale 40-50% correction in equities from their all-time highs. However, again, as I mentioned here earlier, it may not be so bloody. If the Fed continues to do what they're doing, then we might see things change for the better. We can see oil here went from $95 a barrel at the relative highs down here towards $82, wiping us back to where we were back in August. This is a really good sign to see. I want to see oil selling off as fast as it's accelerating, and it's doing that right now. So this is a really positive sign in commodities here, even with a lot of oil uh, production cuts across the globe, to see that demand may be cooling down or deaccelerating faster than supply is deaccelerating. That's a good sign to see. That's going to help the Fed in their fight against inflation. A 13% decline in a matter of just a, you know, practically one week, this is really good stuff to see. This is a step in the right direction. However, we've got a long way to go. We've also got natural gas as well, which is slowly ticking up towards the range we talked about in the Dash report for a long period of time, coming and filling this gap. Again, we've been bullish on natural gas for the past few months here as it's continued to accelerate. And we expected essentially that we'd have this secondary wave. It's not going to go as high as the previous highs, probably the same case for oil. But at the same time, even if the Fed is doing things right here, you know, in the near term, they had a couple pause or quote unquote pivots or short term windows of time where they waited for the economic data, and that's allowed for some reacceleration of commodities. We also have uranium as well, which is continuing to tick higher, its highest level since 2011 or 2008, as we've seen a reacceleration in demand and a shortage of supply in the market. So, again, uh, this is going to increase energy prices and utility bills. So we need to be made aware of these things and be watching these. If these start to cool down here, that's going to be your first initial sign that, you know, essentially we're having the better of two scenarios. We're going to have a short-term recession. It's going to cause a little pain. Equities will probably go back down towards their lows, that 33% correction that we saw back in October 2022. Bitcoin could likely come back down towards a similar low range uh, that it saw before, around 15K to 17K. And that would actually be a pretty good scenario. Maybe get a double bottom across most assets. That would be if the Fed does things right. 
Right, so if we do see the Fed continuing to tighten here, again, just to kind of draw this out here, yeah, you get a valuation contraction and you come back down this range and you likely get some buyers. That would be a really great scenario here. However, if the Fed starts to pivot, while well, equities may benefit from it in the near term, or crypto might see some positive outcome in the near term, that is going to likely mean that we're going for a long-term depression. And that will eventually lead us towards lower lows on both asset classes, in my opinion. Right? So again, just taking it back here to Bitcoin, guys, uh, there's no significant trend. This definitely doesn't look like a bull market to me when, for example, from March of 2023 to October of 2023, we are sitting sideways. We've broken through the ascending channel. We can't clear through clear resistance here between 28 to 32K. I think it's time for us to maintain a conservative approach here to where we expect crypto going. I think we need to be patient here and wait for real signs of optimism here, and more specifically signs that liquidity is going to be on our side as crypto is incredibly hungry for liquidity. It's the lifeblood of risk on assets like Bitcoin. We may say that Bitcoin's risk off, yada, yada, whatever. We might have our narratives of what we believe Bitcoin is. But at the end of the day, Bitcoin does best when there's increases in the money supply and there is essentially an increase in risk on mentality. And none of those are happening right now, guys. we got to be realistic about that. So that's it for today's video, everyone. If you happen to enjoy this video, consider dropping a like. It's one of the greatest ways you guys can support this rambling here on the channel. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. I will see you guys back here on Monday. And if you guys are looking for some additional content, you can always check out the Dash Report down below in the description. It's a great way to support the channel and what we do here, as well as get some awesome content outside of the free content we put out here on the channel. But that's going to be it for today's video, everyone. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone.